do want to just spend some time reflecting on Psalm 71, and I really just want to pick up the theme of facing our limitations. This is a psalm written, whoever it was who wrote it, um, but this is a psalm written by, if you will, a grey-haired man, an older man uh, looking back at his life. I am old and grey. Now in my old age, there are moments of deep reflection that he's going into, which is the kind of reflection you go to when you are an older person and you're facing some of the particular vulnerabilities and challenges that older people face. And then out of that context, you look back at your life through those particular eyes. And for him, what he's confronted with is two areas. On the one hand, what he's doing is he's feeling his limitations. And so, uh, for example, one of the limitations he's feeling, one of the areas that he's struggling with as he's now entering his older years, is this fear of being abandoned. Surely once I get too old, once I get gray hair, once my energy and my life force is not as powerful as it once was, once my voice is not as strong, once uh, you know, younger people are coming up and taking, up, taking positions of influence and leadership, and all of a sudden, you know, I used to be a leader, I used to be a powerful person, and now other people are beginning to, younger people are beginning to take those roles. And one of the fears that rises up within him is this fear of being abandoned. Now that I am old and gray, do not abandon me, O God. Now that I can, at least in the eyes of the world, be seen as having less utility, less usefulness, do not throw me on the scrap heap and bring someone who's younger and fitter and, you know, has more energy. Don't abandon me, God. Don't set me aside. Don't abandon me when, just because my strength is failing. You can hear in that the fear of abandonment. You also hear in his voice in this psalm that he's feeling his vulnerability to others. He says, now in my old age, my enemies are whispering against me. They are planning together to kill me. They say, God has abandoned him. Let's go and get him, for no one will help him now. If we imagine this as being David, and it doesn't, it doesn't say that it was David, but let's just imagine someone like a David figure. You can imagine David in his heyday, in his younger years, in the peak of his strength and his military might, if uh, he ever had any challenges to his throne, challenges to his authority, he would probably feel that within himself he had enough strength to fight them off. You know, I, you know are you, you going to come at me? Well, I'll come at you. You know, you're going to do it. But in his older years, what he's finding is that he doesn't have the same strength to be able to fight them off. And the confidence that he had in himself, I have enough strength, I have enough power, I have enough influence, I have all I need to be able to stand for myself against all the slings and arrows that people might throw at me, that confidence and that strength is no longer there. People are now looking at him and going, he's an old man. Maybe he's in our way. Maybe we can get together and knock him off and you know, we can start some new things. And in his younger years, he would, have known, he would have had the strength to be able to deal with that. And he would have felt much more powerful to be able to confront those challenges. But now he's feeling vulnerable. He's going, oh, I'm not sure what defense I have against this. I'm not sure what it means for me to be able to stand in a world in which, which more and more people are beginning to plot against me and seek to take the positions that I hold and step into the areas that I've, I lead in and, I, and I, I'm in. I don't have the power to withstand that. The vulnerability of his age is beginning to creep up on him. But probably the biggest theme throughout this psalm, and it's there in the first verse, it's there in the last verse, and it's there in the middle verse. And anything that you start with, you finish with, and you plonk in the middle, it's probably a good indication that it's probably the thing that's most on your, in your headspace right now. But it's the fear of shame. Oh Lord, I have come to you for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. Don't let me be disgraced. Don't let me be dishonored. Don't let me, me be made a fool of. Don't let me be overlooked. Don't let me be ignored. Don't let me be left behind. And he comes back to that theme in the middle and he comes back to that theme in the end. Actually, uh, by, by the end of the psalm, what he's saying is the shame and the dishonor that people are throwing at me, God, can you visit it back on them? Pay them back the very thing that they're trying to throw at me. And he turns the whole idea of shame around uh, as something rather than receiving it as something that he's seeking other people who wish to give shame to then experience that for themselves so they can understand what it is that they are trying to put upon other people. But can you hear the vulnerability in that? The fear of being shamed. So an old man, fear of being abandoned, feeling vulnerable in ways that maybe he's never felt vulnerable before. And feeling shamed, 
or at least the potential of shame, dishonoured, overlooked, ignored, left behind. But at the same time that he's wrestling with this status and this time in his life, coming to understand the new reality that he's stepping into as his body is aging and his strength is beginning to wane, these are realities that no amount of prayer can overcome. These are realities that no amount of of effort on his part, part is going to be able to cover over. These are realities that he now needs to learn how to live with. He doesn't stop at that pace. He also is a man who finds his strength. But he finds his strength not in the ways that maybe his younger self would have, would have found his strength, through his political abilities, through his, his strong right arm, through his military might, through all these other natural tools that maybe a younger man would have uh, found confidence in. Now that those tools are no longer available to him in the same way, he has to look for strength outside of himself. And the first place he looks for strength is he remembers God's faithfulness. From the very time I was born, God, I can now sit back and I can, you know, the advantage that he has over younger people is that he can look back further. And for a younger person that they might go, well, I'm not sure that God can be trusted to be faithful in my life because I've only had 20 years of life to calculate that from. And that's not a very big sample set to develop any confidence. But this person is able to look back many decades and say, God has been faithful. Matter of fact, from the time of my birth, from the time that I came out of my mother's womb, God has cared for me. God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things that you do. He begins to find his strength, not within himself, but find his strength by reminding himself of God's faithfulness. How has God been faithful to him throughout his life? What is the evidence in his life of God's goodness and faithfulness, God's protection, God's security in his life? And how do those memories help him? How do those stories help him in this moment of vulnerability and processing this new era of life he's stepping into? And because of those stories, one of the things that he sets his mind to, and this is a theme, I'm just picking out samples from the psalm, but this is a theme throughout the whole psalm, is he commits himself to putting his hope in in God every day. He says, but I will keep on hoping for your help. I will praise you more and more. I will tell everyone about your righteousness. I will tell everyone that you alone are just. I will keep on hoping for your help. I will praise you more and more. Can you hear the active choice that he's making in that moment? God, I'm feeling vulnerable. God, I'm facing weaknesses that I no longer have the ability to overcome. I'm feeling vulnerabilities that actually will probably be a natural part of my life. There's no way I can wish them away or pray them away as I'm journeying the the natural journey of life. This is now the new normal. That's a phrase that we're all got used to using. This is now my new normal. This is now the way that I have to learn how to live. But in that, I'm going to make a decision. God, you have been faithful to me. And because you've been faithful to me, I know you have not abandoned me. And I, so I will keep on hoping for your help. I will keep on putting my trust and my faith in you. And I will speak words of praise to your glory and to your goodness each and every day. Whether I feel like it, whether it makes sense, whether I'm having a good day or a bad day, whether these enemies who are seeking to take advantage of my weakness uh, succeed or not, The one truth that I will continue to hold on to is the truth that God is faithful and I can put my hope and my trust in him as my rock and my security. And that leads directly to to this other major theme throughout the psalm, that all the way through the psalm, he holds his confidence in God. I love verses 20 to 21. Have a listen to this. You have allowed me to suffer much hardship. How many of us who have journeyed through life for quite a number of decades and have got a bit of life that we can now begin to look back on, how many of us recognize that hardships are a part of life? doesn't matter how hard you pray, doesn't matter how diligently you worship, it doesn't matter how excited you are and how enthusiastic you are and how powerful you are and how educated you are, it doesn't matter. Any of us who have lived any life for any length of time can look back and we can recognize hardships and pains and sorrows and tragedies. 
And this psalmist is being very real in that. He says, you know what, God, you have allowed me to suffer much hardship. It's not hardship has happened to me, and God's going, oops, sorry, how did that happen? Got no idea. It's like, no, no, no. You have been with me, and you have allowed hardships to enter into my life as we have each been living our natural lives. But you will restore me to life again, and you will lift me up from the depths of the earth. You will restore me to even greater honor, and you will comfort me once again. Feeling the vulnerability of his season of life, but finding confidence in the faithfulness of God. I'm going to ask Gillian Cortell and um, Harvey Wood, if they wouldn't mind just coming up and joining me on stage. As I was reflecting on the themes of this psalm, I thought, wouldn't it be great Rather than me drawing out my own applications and thoughts, why don't we actually just open the floor a little bit and let's um, hear for some people for whom some of these themes may, they may be able to add additional light and give additional wisdom to, to the themes that we've been exploring in this particular psalm. So I picked the two youngest people in the church, uh, two spring chickens. I just thought, well, you know, let's, let, let's hear their voices and then us older people here, we can, uh, we, we can maybe process that ourselves. Um, but I really appreciate both of you. I called them both up and I said, are you happy if I publicly call you out as older people in the church? And they went, yeah, that's, that's okay. We, we, you know, we'll, we'll own that badge. It'll be a badge of honour. And I believe it is a badge of honour because I believe that the work that God has done in both of your lives helps to bring us great wisdom. But as we reflect on this, this psalm, I'm going to ask you two questions and then I'm going to drop a surprise third. So, so you're expecting the first two questions. Uh, I'm going to drop a surprise third question on you. And the surprise third question, I'll give you advance notice, is this. How does... It's not a surprise. Sorry. Would you like it a surprise? I'll, I'll hold it back. That's fine. The surprise third question... Oh, okay. All right. Well, in that case, I feel like I shouldn't tell you the surprise third question. All right. In which case, let, let me actually give you the first question, which is, in what ways have you experienced a sense of limitation and vulnerability as you have aged? Would you like to hold the microphone? Or I can hold um, it, it's, you see it all around you. You see it in yourself. We're all getting weaker. I had an experience just last week. Uh, called up a friend who was given three months to live the day my grandson was born. He's, she, he's now 22 and I'm still talking to her. Um, but she does have weaknesses. But she said... Uh, What's wrong with you, Gillian? I said, what do you mean? She said, well, we all have something wrong with us. I said, that is true. But we have to, you know, what do we do now? I think that the big thing about the vulnerable uh, issue for me is being, knowing what you talked about before. What, what's next? When, when do I stop doing what I'm doing? I'm a bit of a Duracell bunny and I start and keep going. When's the right time to stop and give other people an opportunity? And, and what am I to do next? It might be something quite different. And the other thing is being prepared to be helped, be, being ready to be, be helped along the way. And I'm learning that very quickly. You've all heard the saying of um, you're old as you feel. Well, I don't re really reckon I'm qualified to be up here because I do genuinely feel a lot younger than my chronological age. And I was reading recently there's a thing called biological age now and you can plug yourself into a computer, answer a whole lot of questions and it will tell you how, what your biological age is. And of course you aim to have that considerably lower than your chronological age. So, but to answer the question, um, to, to be quite honest at this stage of life, God's, well, God's blessed me all through my life, but at this stage I feel so blessed that I don't have most of the limitations and problems that of older people um, and so um, life is great for me um, however I realize that that mightn't continue forever um, so I'm working on a few guiding principles um, and uh, let me just share a couple of those with you um, I think we all as Christians uh, want to live our lives in a way in which we trust God uh, no matter whether the circumstances are good or not so good um, because God provides answers when uh, difficulties come up. Um, so uh, that's how all of us, I guess, would try and live our lives, probably a little bit imperfectly now and then, but that's how we're trying to live our lives. So 
My plan is to continue doing that. Um, and a, a second thing is that when you're looking at why people stay in churches and don't move off to the next church, um, what I've discovered over time and through several church splits that I've been <laughs> involved in, uh, not causing them, <laughs> as you <laughs> add, <laughs> um, the two criteria that you really want to try and make sure everybody in your congregation enjoy these two things. The first one is to have some ministry within the church. So God's given you a gift, then use it, and then you feel part of it and there's purpose in being part of the church. Uh, and the second one is um, to have good relationships with a range of people, again, within your church. So if that's a good principle on how to run a church, um, then I think that's a good principle for life too. And when I checked out what imminent psychologists say about uh, these sorts of things, they said the two key things to do as you get older is to make sure that you re maintain purpose in life. It might be different purposes now, but uh, maintain a purpose. Um, but secondly, to make sure you've got a... Uh, a wonderful group of people, relatives even, um, in, in your uh, group of people around you. And, of course, being part of here of Canterbury, uh, you immediately have that circle of friends and then get involved in a ministry and then you get another special group of friends within the church who are the ones that are co-ministering with you. Um, so that's my second principle. And the third principle is... Um, Try not to stop doing things that you used to do. Just find sneakier, smarter ways to do them so people don't realise you're not quite as capable as you used to be. <laughs> so I was a principal for 21 years, as you probably all know, um, and um, I thought, it's time to come. I want to just work part-time so I don't have so many problems to deal with. Um, so, I, as you know, I work two days a week as a teacher, um, but once I changed to that, um, I was then asked to become a deacon in the church, so I now have two jobs instead of one. Um, and then I've been asked to be a consultant in another Christian activity. And so I've now got three jobs instead of one, so that's how I'm managing with uh, getting a bit older. And my final point is um, they invented retirement back in Germany, back in the early 1900s, I think, because uh, they wanted to, they had a lot of unemployment of younger people and they wanted a way to stop um, or to give those people opportunity to work. So they said, right, to the older people, once you reach this age, you have to stop working so other people can take over your job. Um, they soon realised that uh, there was no pension involved in that, that was just what you did, and the families had to look after the older people. They worked out that didn't work, so they brought in the idea of a pension, uh, and then everybody else in the world uh, joined into that. Um, and uh, the age they chose, magically, was 65, and we don't seem to have changed that, even though we live a lot longer. But the key, the key thing for me is, I don't believe in retirement. It was a thing the Germans invented years ago. We don't have to retire. We just keep on doing things, but we do them differently. That's good. There we go. Second question. What memories of God's faithfulness help to sustain and to strengthen you? Yeah, I've just been thinking of some coincidences that, um, and I'll a fairly trivial one as an example. We used to have a Bible study at Lynn Salter's house regularly, and one day Lynn got bitten by her dog, and so she had to go to the doctor, and we didn't go. And that day, my cousins from the country knocked on the door. And that's, it's a little one. I could say bigger ones, but that sort of thing makes you think, why do Christians worry? And the other one, um, the day after my daughter-in-law died, tragically, um, a school friend of mine from Tasmania rang me and quoted a particular hymn, God Holds the Key of All Unknown. That was the hymn at my brother's funeral when I was 10. So, you know, God is still there, even with the same reminders going on. And as I say, we still worry. Uh, 
Uh, there's an Old Testament name for God, which we don't hear these days. I remember when I was younger, I used to hear it in church a fair bit, but it's Jehovah Jireh. Um, hands up if you've heard that name. Oh, right. We've got a lot of old people here, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Jehovah Jireh is uh, God the provider and um, if we're looking back over our lives we can see there's so many different ways in which God provides for us obviously there's the sort of physical things like having a house to live in and so on um, but it's also in providing the relationships that enrich our lives it's in the way we all have so many opportunities um, particularly in the kind of society we live now um, so many opportunities for using uh, the gifts that God's given us to contribute to the well-being of other people and the furtherance of our, our country and so on. Um, so um, I think that um, just remembering the many things that um, God has blessed me with throughout my life uh, by providing them when I needed them um, and, uh, and trusting him that that's going to continue for whatever uh, years I have in the future. So now for the third question, Harvey, I'm going to start with you, just so Gillian gets a few extra minutes to uh, think through the surprise question that you didn't want to know in advance. <laughs> um, so as you heard the reading of Psalm 71 today, and as you heard some of the reflections that I brought, how does Psalm 71 speak to you? I, I guess... Um, uh, knowing a bit about, uh, let's assume it's David, but, you know, that's a, a bit debatable. Thanks, John, for bringing that up for us. Um, but I'll work on it being David. But if it were David, the, uh, then um, he had so many difficulties in his life. And uh, when I sort of compare my life with, with him, um, God's blessed me in so many rich ways. Of course, we all have down times and sad times and sometimes really complex and difficult things to deal with. Uh, but uh, God, if we trust in him, he'll help us through those. And I just have to, or I don't have to, I want to acknowledge that God's really blessed me and I haven't had a whole lot of those things to deal with. But I, my heart really goes out to people who have really difficult, significant difficulties. And there are some people you know, they get difficulty after difficulty after difficulty in their lives and I just wonder how they manage uh, if they don't have a strong faith in God. Yeah, well it's quite, it's quite radical um, when you think you've got enemies wanting to kill you. Like my main issue, it's, it's not really an issue, but it could be that... At, um, People might suggest you shuffle off sideways, oh, that sort of thing. That's not quite, well, they're not, but uh, that might, could be the sort of thing, but that's not seek to kill you. It's, um, he, he has a wonderful example of strong faith. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you, Gillian. Really appreciate your willingness to come up and just share. So thank you for that. Were any of those reflections helpful for you? You may be thinking about the way that these words from this psalm might impact your life as well. How does Psalm 71 speak to you? How does Psalm 71 speak to you? I think the image of the grey-haired man, old age, the vulnerabilities and the challenges that are particular to that time of life, I think in Psalm 71 we can... We can treat it literally, which I think we need to. Here's a reflection of an older person looking at their life. I think there's much truth for us to absorb and to hear in that. But I do think we can extend it into a bit of a metaphor as well. If old age is a season in which we begin to increasingly feel our vulnerabilities, feel the loss of strength, feel something of the ebbing of life, something of the vitality of life that maybe in our youth we felt at, at its peak and then maybe as we get older that energy dissipates and changes and maybe is less present in our life. Maybe for, for us we can recognise that there are things that are happening in our life which maybe aren't necessarily turning our hair grey 
But nonetheless, there is a sense in which life is being robbed from us. So maybe we can take this old age image in Psalm 71 as a bit of a metaphor for similar situations of vulnerability that we might face. And situations in which we need to come to terms with the limitations of ourselves, the limitations of our circumstances, the limitations of the life in which we are called to live. So if we take it metaphorically, that means it's not just a psalm for older people, it's actually a psalm for all of us. And in that, I just want to lead you into two points of reflection and invite you into a time of just, with your eyes open, but just a time where your heart is quiet before the Lord. And I want to lead you into two spaces of reflection as we consider what, how this psalm speaks to us. I think the first one is this. One of the things I love about the psalm is that the psalmist is honestly remembering his vulnerabilities. He's not, he's not avoiding them. He's not explaining them away. He's not diminishing them. He's actually taking a really hard, cold look at himself. And in a sense of deep honesty, but also deep humility, he's willing to say, I'm not the man I was. And things are getting on top of me. And I don't have the strength that maybe I once had to pull myself through some of this stuff. I'm really actually very vulnerable right now. I want you to sit with that thought and I want you to consider how it is that those words may apply to you in whatever situation it is that you're facing or that you're reflecting on. And as you do that, allow me to read out verses 9 to 12 from our reading today as we consider honestly remembering our vulnerabilities. How do these words hit you? And now my old age, in my vulnerability, in the limitation of life in which I currently sit, God, please don't set me aside. Don't abandon me when my strength is failing. For my enemies, who are the enemies in this context for you? What is it that brings you that sense of vulnerability and limitation and constriction? sense of being overwhelmed or even threatened. These are whoever these enemies are. For my enemies are whispering against me. They are plotting together to kill me, to rob me of life. They say, look, God has abandoned him. Let's go and get him. For no one will help him. God, don't stay away. My God, please hurry to help me. That's one voice in Psalm 71. And while holding that voice is true and real and necessary and important, the psalmist also gives us a second voice. This is the voice that in the middle of that vulnerability is also able to see beyond himself, beyond his vulnerabilities, beyond his limitations, and he's able to celebrate the goodness of God. As a matter of fact, he even has the discipline of words, the discipline of speaking words of praise to God even when he doesn't feel like it, the discipline of telling the people around him the good, uh, stories about the goodness of God in his life even while he's still feeling vulnerable and still feeling his limitations. Verses 15 to 17 of our reading today, consider what it means for you to celebrate God's goodness. Consider what it means for you to begin to speak out words that remind yourself of the goodness of God and that remind people around you of the goodness of God in your life. Think about what this looks like as I read to you verses 15 to 17. I will tell everyone about your righteousness. All day long I will proclaim your saving power, though I am not skilled with words. You don't have to be skilled with words to speak of what God is doing in your life. 
Sometimes just saying the words out loud, hearing yourself say it, sharing it with people at your table or people around you, it lifts your spirit. You don't have to be skilled with words. But sometimes, or often, our words shape our hearts. It shapes our focus. Our words can lead us. All day long, I will proclaim your saving power, though I am not skilled with words. I will praise your mighty deeds, O sovereign Lord. I will tell everyone that you alone are just. O God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things you do. What does it look like for you this week in the week we have ahead of us to hold those two things together? What does it mean for you to be willing and able to speak truthful words of vulnerability and limitation? Not to avoid, not to dismiss, not to belittle, not to pretend these things aren't real, but actually to face up with true and deep humility. That we are not strong enough. We're not able to save ourselves. Life does get on top of us. We hit our limitations. What does it mean for each of us in our own way, among people that we trust, to be willing to make that confession? You know what? I'm having a bad week. You know what? I'm feeling really vulnerable right now. You know what? I'm feeling quite, I feel really struggling with my limitations. I feel like I should be able to do better, but I just can't do it. Don't be afraid to speak those words. These are not words that are lack of faith. Psalm 71 gives us these words because these words are true words and God commands us to speak true words. At the same time, what does it look like for you to also speak the other words? The words that say, you know what? Let me take a moment to just step back from the pressure that I feel around me, to step back from the limitations that I feel confronted by, to step back from the vulnerabilities that make me feel insecure. Let me recognize that I've always been part of a much, much bigger story. I've always been part of a of the work and the call and the family of God. And when I lift my eyes, I can celebrate that God has held me. God has kept me. God has given me strength. God has given me hope and purpose. What does it mean for you to speak those words? Don't just think them, but speak them to each other. Hear yourself say them out loud find comfort and hope as you celebrate the goodness of God. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for the powerful, the authentic, the necessary words of Psalm 71. Thank you that they cut right down to the very heart of who we are and they confront us with something that's very deep and true about ourselves, but they also remind us of your incredible grace and goodness. Thank you that you have never and will never abandon us. Thank you that you are always our strong tower and our place of ultimate safety. Thank you, Lord God, that when we are at our weakest, that is when you embrace us the most. And we are never alone. Heavenly Father, give us the willingness to, to humbly acknowledge the struggles that we do face. And give us the faith to be able to see and even to speak words that acknowledge and celebrate your goodness, your ongoing goodness in our lives. May the words of Psalm 71 be words that become our words, not just our private prayer words, but even words that in connect groups or in conversations with each other, we find a willingness to speak to each other. Words of vulnerability and words of the goodness of God. Oh God, we commit all these reflections into your hands. We ask that you by your spirit would do a gracious work in each of our hearts. Jesus' name.